The title of my talk is Responders and Non-Responders, Baseline Metabolic Condition Affects Response to Resistant Starch. And the disclosures, um, this program has received financial support from the organizations listed in the program. I personally have received research grant funding from Ingredion Incorporated. Uh, they provided both the product and the funding for the study that I'm going to tell you about today. And how did we mitigate potential bias? This was an investigator-initiated study, and the investigative team was responsible for study design, data analysis, and all of the, the results that I'm going to show you today. So you've already heard quite a bit about resistant starch. It's a type of dietary fiber that has beneficial effects on insulin sensitivity. Uh, the mechanism is not fully understood, as you've seen in the earlier two presentations, there's a number of possible ways that resistant starch may act. Uh, a lot of the effects of resistant starch are attributed to fermentation in the hindgut, the production of the little fatty acids. And these fatty acids are known to have a number of beneficial effects. Uh, one of them which I'm going to touch on briefly day, today is the possibility that they can increase synthesis and secretion of the hormone adiponectin. Uh, adiponectin is an adipocyte-derived hormone. It's produced in mature adipocytes, and it has profound insulin sensitizing effects, both in animal models and in humans. This slide is from the Nurses' Health Study in women with type 2 diabetes, and it shows the effect of generalized dietary fiber intake on adiponectin levels. And what you can see is across the range of body mass index that we're looking at lean obese, overweight and obese individuals, greater cereal fiber intake is associated with greater serum adiponectin. There, and this is particularly striking in the lean individuals. The next slide here shows a study that was done in an animal model actually using resistant, star resistant starch as the source of dietary fiber. So these mice um, we're given two different doses of resistant starch, either 18% or 36%. And what you can see here is the adiponectin protein content in the epididymal fat pad of the animals. And there was a significant increase in adiponectin. Sorry, this pointer doesn't work very well. But you can see in the third group, what's that? Right, um, you can see in the third group here, that the adiponectin levels were significantly increased by the 36% resistant starch feeding. There have been relatively fewer studies done in humans. And Denise touched on this study earlier. Uh, this was actually the impetus for the clinical trial that I'm going to tell you about today. And that is the sex difference in response to resistant starch. This is the study by Mackey et al. It was a it was done in both women and men with two different doses of resistant starch, 15 and 30 grams per day, and four-week treatment period. And as you can see, these are the results from the study broken down by sex, men on the left, women on the right. The men, this is an insulin sensitivity from an intravenous glucose tolerance test and minimal modeling. And the men responded beautifully to both doses, the 15 and the 30, with an increase in insulin sensitivity and there was no response in the women. So the, there was some speculation as to why this uh, might have occurred. Um, one possibility is that the study was not controlled for menstrual cycle phase. There's a well-documented decrease in insulin sensitivity during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. It's thought to be due to the elevated sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And it, so if you don't, test consistently in one phase or another, it could muddy the waters in terms of the results. Also, the, the study included both pre- and post-menopausal women, and it didn't consider whether maybe the resistant starch worked better or differently in one group or the other. So again, the possibility that the hormonal environment 
was playing a role. And finally, women have much higher insulin sensitivity than women. That's not obvious from these data here because these individuals were all obese. But for anyone who's done insulin sensitivity testing, it's quite profound. Um, w without a doubt, women have much higher, even, even obese women have much higher insulin sensitivity than men. So the thought was maybe the resistant starch just, it works better in men because men start out lower. So there's an effect of baseline insulin sensitivity on the response. But this study wasn't really powered to get at that. So with that background then, the study that I'm going to tell you about had the following objectives. We wanted to look at the effects of high amylose maize resistant starch on insulin sensitivity in women, controlling for those variables that I mentioned in the last slide. We tested only during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. We controlled for menopausal status in the sense that we targeted recruitment of both equal numbers of pre- and post-menopausal women, and we considered menopausal status in the statistical design of the results. We also tested for an effect of baseline insulin sensitivity, high insulin sensitivity at baseline versus low. Um, and we did this, I'll show you the slides um, in a few minutes, by using a Gaussian type distribution analysis to actually objectively identify insulin. We call the low insulin sensitivity group our insulin resistant women, and then the high insulin sensitivity group our insulin sensitive women. We also recruited we, we, our target for recruitment was 50% African-American women. I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and we have a large African-American population, and this population is particularly at high risk for type 2 diabetes. My work and work of others has shown that African-Americans in general, as a group, have much lower insulin sensitivity. So we thought by enriching the subject population in African-Americans, we would be likely to include women that started out fairly insulin resistant. Uh, we also wanted to take a look at the hormone adiponectin and see if this was playing into our response at all. And finally, this is one of the first studies that was testing the feasibility and effectiveness of, of administering the resistant starch to snack food. Many of the studies you heard about earlier used the sachet approach. They use a powdered starch that could be sprinkled, sprinkled into yogurt or a soup or another food. Uh, but realistically, as Denise mentioned, we need to move this forward if it's going to be effective at a population level and see if we can actually administer it as, as a, a food item. So subjects were 40 healthy sedentary women. They were randomized to a double-blind crossover study design. The resistant starch was consumed as a snack food, in this case cookies. Again, we used three doses, 0, 15, and 30 grams of resistant starch per day. All women consumed all doses in, in four-week treatment arms with a four-week washout in between. So if you do the math with that, any one woman could be in the study for up to six months. This was a fairly demanding study. They had to undergo an insulin sensitivity test using the intravenous glucose tolerance test at the end of each of the four-week treatment arms. So we did have a number of women drop out of the study. We tried to replace them as best as we could, um, but that ended up being one of the limitations of the study. We, the women were asked to consume two baggies. You can, the, what it, we're, you're looking at here is a photograph of the, there we go, the actual food product that the women consumed. Um, these are one ounce baggies of cookies. This is the lemon cookie. Um, we received the cookies from the manufacturer in large foil pouches, and our metabolic kitchen staff weighed them out individually into one ounce portion. The women were asked to consume two of these per day. They came to the clinic once a week to pick up their supply for the week. Any one woman then would have consumed 168 baggies of cookies during the course of the study, and our metabolic kitchen staff weighed out, this is a conservative estimate, approximately 7,000 baggies. So the statistical analysis, we, as I mentioned, we use a Gaussian approach to objectively assess whether the women were insulin resistant or insulin sensitive. We then used mixed, model, mixed effects modeling to identify predictors of insulin sensitivity. And so this would be the various starch doses. We also included a number of covariates. 
And we adjust it for waist circumference because both obesity and abdominal fat are known to affect insulin sensitivity. And we also adjust it for completer status. This is whether the women completed all three phases of the study. And our rationale was that if a woman stuck it out for six months, she was probably really diligent and really adherent. And she may actually have been better about consuming all of the cookies. Um, and in interim analysis, we had a significant effect of completer status. So that was one of our covariates. This shows you the distribution of insulin sensitivity across the participant population. Um, and what you can see is we had 75% of the women fell into this lower distribution here. The average insulin sensitivity was around four, but we had a smaller percentage of women, about 25%, that fell into this higher distribution of insulin sensitivity here with the, the median being around 13. These are the baseline characteristics of the participants by insulin sensitivity status. So insulin resistant here on the left side, insulin sensitive here. This is after the placebo arm. So they'd eaten cookies for four weeks, but it had no starch in it. Um, menopausal status was about equally distributed in insulin sensitive and insulin resistant. But what's striking if you look at the ethnic distribution, we had Caucasians and African Americans and virtually all of the women in the insulin sensitive group were white. So all of our African American participants fell into the insulin resistant category. Um, by design, insulin sensitivity was lower in the insulin resistant group, of course, and these women also had higher fasting insulin and higher fasting glucose. So these are the results of the study. This is the overall results from the mixed model design. And I'm showing you both the actual model on the right here, and then these are the adjusted means by starch dose on the left. So this is a little bit easier to look at. Um, this is 0, 15, and 30 grams per day. Again, tested after the completion of that particular arm. And what you can see is we got a, a statistically significant effect of the higher dose of resistant starch, the 30 grams per day, after adjusting for covariates. This is only within the insulin resistant women. We did the modeling separately within each group, and we did not get an effect within the insulin sensitive women. Um, we didn't see anything that suggested it, uh, an effect of resistant starch, but again, this was a much smaller group. 75% of the women were in this insulin resistant category. I mentioned that we were going to look at adiponectin. Um, uh, th this, these are the raw, unadjusted data looking at adiponectin versus insulin sensitivity. And there's a number of confounding factors with adiponectin, such as obesity, status, and race, that I have not taken into account here. But what you can see is a very strong positive association, which is what we'd predict. This is what many studies have shown, of a high correlation between adiponectin and insulin sensitivity. When we looked, Overall, to see if the resistant starch had an effect on adiponectin in the whole group combined, we didn't see it. Nor did we see it if we looked just by a high insulin sensitivity or low insulin sensitivity. Uh, but what we did find is when we broke it down by ethnicity, we got a striking effect of resistant starch consumption on adiponectin. And those are the data you're looking at here. So here are the data from the black women with both groups of resistant starch, the 15 and the 30. We got a significant increase in adiponectin, um, nothing in the white women. Uh, and I met, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we and others have observed a strikingly lower insulin sensitivity in African Americans. So these data are shown here. These are the actual women that were in our study. And you can see that this is after the placebo arm of the starch. Uh, significantly lower insulin sensitivity in the black women. And the black women also had lower adiponectin, about two-fold lower. So the white women had about uh, 14 micrograms per mil adiponectin, and the black women had about seven. If we looked, this is just looking at change in insulin sensitivity with starch treatment in black and white women now, and these are unadjusted data. Um, we don't, we're not really powered to do this. This is breaking it down into three groups, looking at insulin-sensitive white, insulin-resistant white, and black. So this is really more of a qualitative analysis. But it is interesting. Um, what we found, and these are totally unadjusted data, these are just raw data from the end of the 
three starch arms, we did get what is almost here a dose response with an increase in insulin sensitivity in the black women. It seems to go up a little bit at 15 and up more at 30. So it does suggest perhaps that the, the significant effect that we saw with resistant starch consumption at the low dose may have been driven by the black women. So in conclusion, consumption of resistant starch in the form of a snack food item was associated with improved insulin sensitivity in women who were insulin resistant at baseline. Um, this, in our hands, this was primarily our African American women, which is a group at increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, we don't know if resistant starch is acting through adiponectinase. It's a provocative possibility that requires further testing. Um, and importantly, resistant starch may be an appropriate dietary ingredient to reduce risk for diabetes in women who are insulin resistant. There were a number of limitations of this study. Uh, we fed them cookies, and the cookies were, based, were baked in a dough that contained added sugar and processed flour. So of course, it's possible that if we had used a more healthful matrix for the cookies, we might have seen different results. And that might be something to try in the future. Um, I mentioned that a number of women dropped out of the study, and that one of the main reasons was that they just couldn't eat two bags of cookies a day. It's a lot of cookies to eat. I mean, it sounds great, <laughs> and the cookies were really good, but surprisingly, that was one of the comments that they made. So maybe in the future, what I would think about doing was providing more variety in the delivery of the resistant starch. Um, and the women actually said they would have liked to have consumed the sachets, that they'd be totally okay with sprinkling the powder into their food. Um, acknowledgements, Ingredion Incorporated provided the support and the cookies for the study, and the core laboratories at UAB uh, provided a lot of support. This was really a demanding study to do, so uh, many thanks to our Diabetes Research Center, our Nutrition Obesity Research Center, and our Center for Clinical and Translational Science, Metabolic Kitchen, that provided, they met with the participants every week and gave them their cookies and weighed out all the cookies. Thank you. <laughs>